I'm delighted that you've joined us. Welcome back if you've been following this series previously. Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. The title of our series reflects the book of Revelation and three messages that God sent to John on the island of Patmos. They're called the Three Angels' Messages. They're found in Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12. Let's summarize what we have studied so far in this series. This is a series of 13 separate presentations. So far, we've discovered the fact that all of the book of Revelation leads us to make eternal choices. The book of Revelation is about the Christ who invites us to make these choices in the light of eternity. We've also studied that the gospel of God's grace would go to the ends of the earth before the return of Christ that there would be a message that would leap across geographical boundaries, a message that would penetrate every language group. Here is something bigger and larger than any of the small plans that human beings make. And God invites us to be something, part of something large for him. Also, we've studied the fact that this message that would go to the ends of the earth was pictured as being carried by angels, symbolically. One of those angels says with a loud voice, fear God. That word fear means respect God. It's an attitude of obedience toward God. Then the angel says, give glory to him. Giving glory to God is a way in which we express our faith in him through our lifestyle. We give glory to him by what we eat, what we drink, how we live, our attitudes. We give glory to God by the things we place in our minds. Here is an urgent call in the light of eternity's judgment for a full, complete consecration to God. Our message says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tribe, and people, saying with a loud voice for emphasis, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment not will come, but has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Here is a message that calls us in an age of evolution to worship the creator. As we enter into our presentation, let's pray. Father, we hear the call of revelation. We hear the voice of God through the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And Father, as we come to this important topic, we pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit to see new things from your word. Speak to us through your word. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Help us see the importance and significance of creation in an age of evolution. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The title of this presentation is Creation Speaks. Creation speaks to us of God's love. Creation speaks to us of God's power. Creation speaks to us of a God who will restore this world in its Edenic splendor. Creation speaks to us of a creation in the past, a new creation in the future, and how God wants to newly create our lives. Come back with me over the decades to the 1840s. Economic, philosophic, and scientific movements were changing the world. It was here in the 1840s, in fact, in 1844, that Charles Darwin published his first draft of The Origin of Species. That book, The Origin of Species, focusing on evolution, would change the thinking of the world. It was in 1844 that Karl Marx was working on his manuscripts of the Communist Manifesto, another movement of humanism and of dialectic materialism that would change the world. In the 1840s, Samuel Morse made the first digital transmission, their Morse code. That instant communication method would again be part of a scientific movement that would change the world. By 1859, Darwin's thoughts had fully developed. 
And as they did when he published The Origin of Species, many believers in that theory of evolution sensed that we had come to a pivotal moment in the history of this world. In fact, one wrote this, Darwin's Origin of the Species, published in 1859, remains one of history's most influential and talked about scientific papers. It introduced the theory that populations evolve over the course of generations through a process of natural selection, a theory that became the backbone of modern biology. On the origin of species changed the way people think about the world and the origin of the world. The impact of evolutionary thought on science, on philosophy, on psychology and religion is incalculable. The essence of evolution is this. It is the survival of the fittest. And if you take evolution to its logical conclusion, there is no basis for a moral ethic. We are simply enlarged protein molecules. We're simply a random combination of genes and chromosomes. Where is there a moral ethic if we are simply enlarged protein molecules and a more intelligent form of the animal species? There is no basis for a moral ethic. There is no morality on that basis. So evolution really changed not only science, not only philosophy and psychology, but it totally changed the way people think about life. But at the same time, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were writing the first drafts of the Communist Manifesto. Evolution and the Communist Manifesto have something in common, and that is that life revolves around the individual and that there is no hope for eternity. There is nothing beyond. The grave becomes a dark hole in the ground. The end of life becomes a nightmare without a morning. So when you look at evolution, you look at communism, socialism in its extreme forms, dialectic materialism, they offer only one thing, and that is self-gratification today because there is nothing beyond tomorrow. In fact, Karl Marx said this, religion is the opiate of the people. In other words, religion is a myth. It's a fanciful myth, according to Marx's understanding. It is something for people that are intellectual ignoramuses, some people that don't have that thinking capacity. As we look at the 1840s and we see the development of evolution, we see the development of Marxism and with Engels and Marx, and we see the origin of the Communist Manifesto, we have to ask a question, and the question we ask is this, would God leave the world without a witness? These two movements developing simultaneously, evolution and communism, produced an extremely low value on all human life by dismissing the concept of a personal God who's the creator of the universe. So if you accept communism, if you accept its atheistic view, if you accept evolution and the origin of the species and the survival of the fittest, you dismiss the idea of the supernatural, you do away with the first 11 chapters of the Bible immediately, you dismiss the Genesis account, and essentially life becomes a vain pursuit for pleasure. God would not allow the world to be without a witness, and so he sent a message for this hour. And amazingly enough, this message of the three angels was developing at the same time of evolution and communism. It was developing there in the 1840s. God would send a message to this planet. He would raise up a divine movement of destiny. A group of Bible students began to study the word of God. They studied the prophecies of Daniel. They studied the prophecies of Revelation. And as they did, they sensed in this message of Revelation, the 14th chapter, verses 6 to 12, that God had a special message. God had a unique message. God had a message for this generation that is shaped, 
that is tailor-made to meet the challenge of evolution, to meet the challenge of atheism, a message for us today. That message was given to John on the island of Patmos. John was the last of the living disciples. He was there in his 90s. Patmos is an amazing place. I've visited it on numerous occasions, about nine miles long. It's an idyllic island today. It has about 3,000 people living there. You come into its port called Scala, and it was there that John, exiled on the island of Patmos, a prisoner for the Lord, sent there by the pagan Roman emperor Domitian because John would not sacrifice to the idols of Rome. And there on that island, Jesus visited him. There on that island, John had a vision of the future. The island was illuminated with the glory of God. And John there saw these scenes that we are studying in the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ in his last day message to the world. Here, Revelation 1 verse 9 says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation. John says, you're going through trouble. I understand it. I'm a prisoner. I'm in exile on the island of Patmos. His bones ached with pain. His body was racked at times with that suffering and the pain. He says, I, John, your brother in companion in tribulation. And in the kingdom and patience of Christ was on the island of Pat, which is called Patmos, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And there on that island, God broke through. There on that island, God moved powerfully and gave to John the book of Revelation. It was Jesus who visited John. And as he did, he unfolded the future and he unfolded movements that would come down the stream of time and he unfolded his message that would meet the challenge of the time. In Revelation, we read how the revelation of Jesus Christ, how Jesus would unmask the plans of the devil, how Jesus would reveal the plans of God. Revelation is not some common book, not some book dreamed up by a human author. It is God's message for this generation. Revelation 14 is that message described as being carried by three angels in mid-heaven, three cosmic messages. We've been studying it. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Incidentally, when you go into the place where John purportedly, and we don't know for sure, received the vision of Revelation, and it's a cave-like structure, you go down, the monks who are the custodians of that particular place today have placed this placard, and I, I've taken a picture of it, which they believe to be the heart of Revelation. And it says, fear God, very same verse we have here, and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountain, springs of water. It's quite amazing to me that the thousands of people who visit that cave see this very verse, and that even the great religious leaders down through the centuries have sensed there's something special here, a call to worship the creator in an age of evolution. You know, Winston Churchill once said, it's not enough to have lived. We must be determined to have lived for something. And Fyodor Dostoevsky said, the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. When you understand the bigness, when you understand the greatness of this message of the three angels, it's something to live for. It's a purpose that burns in your soul because you sense that when error flooded into this world through creation, when error flooded into this world through dialectic materialism, communism, and atheism, that God had a message to go to the ends of the earth to prepare people for his soon return. And part of that message is a call. It is a clarion call to men and women everywhere that we're not a genetic accident. We're not simply skin covering bones. We're not simply a chromosomal aberration. We didn't simply evolve from the primeval slime, but we were created by a loving God that cares for us. Fear God, give glory to him, 
The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. Now, who is the one who made the heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters? Who is he? What's another name that we call this one? He is the creator. So here is a call in an age of evolution to worship the creator of the heavens. Worship the creator of the earth. Worship the one by whose very word he spoke and stars came into existence. He spoke and earth appeared. He spoke and this dry land was carpeted with living green. He spoke and birds flew and fluttered and fruit trees sprung up. He spoke and human life came into existence as he formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the creator, the all-powerful one. God spoke and this world was, came into existence. You know, my word is a declarative word. I can say, this is a Bible. I can say, that's a screen. I can say, that's a picture. But my word doesn't create that which it says. God's word is so incredibly powerful that God, when God speaks, it is so, even if it were never so before. Because when God speaks, he makes it so. The audible word out of God's mouth becomes tangible matter. So when the all-powerful creator, the almighty creator says, let the sun, moon, and stars appear, the word out of his mouth carries with it creative power that creates what he declares. What God says is so, even if it were never so before, because when God says it, it happens that the power of his word, he is the all-powerful creator. Now, why does creation matter? Why does it matter whether we understand this message, this call to worship the creator? What is the significance of that in our practical lives? When you go back to Genesis 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Now, the word Hebrew word for created there is bara, and bara is something that only God does. He is the creator. We can make something out of something. God can make something out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. To know that it was God that created means that this God is all-powerful. The sun, for example, has a diameter of approximately 860,000 miles, and it could hold one million planets the size of the earth. I mean, you talk about an all-powerful God for him to speak, and this sun comes into existence, this magnificent orb of light in the sky. It's absolutely incredible. The sun is just one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, and the Bible says God knows all those stars by name, an all-powerful God, an all-wise God. Now take the pistol star. It has 10 million times. Did you get that? I don't want to go over that too quickly. It has 10 million times the power generated by the sun. So when you look at these orbs in space, you come to this conclusion. God is incredibly powerful. The God we serve is not weak and powerless. He is rather all-powerful. And you look at the stars. Somebody said if you could count the stars, you'd have as many stars as there were grains of sand in the sea. And God knows every one by name. God created them. God fashioned them by his word. And every one of them, he knows he is an all-powerful God. He's an all-wise God. He's a God with supreme intelligence. Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. The story is told of Napoleon, who one day was sailing on a ship with his sailors. It was a dark night. The stars were twinkling in the sky, and they were all standing on, on the deck talking. And these sailors got into a conversation about the existence of God. And it's reported that Napoleon looked at them and said, look up at the stars and tell me what you think. And he then left them and went on to bed. 
The sailors standing there looking at the stars had that sense in the cosmos of the universe that God indeed was the creator. When we look at creation, why does it matter? It matters because it tells us of an all-powerful, almighty God. And it, as you look down through history, you see how this powerful God has worked. As Israel left Egypt with over a million people coming out of Egypt, well over a million, they came to the Red Sea. The Egyptian armies were behind them. Mountains kept them from fleeing further to their west. There, as they came to the Red Sea, miraculously, God opened that sea divinely. He is the God that created the world with power. He is the God that opened the Red Sea where they came through some 20, 25 miles. And then this same sea at the word of God crashed down on the Egyptian armies, killing them. He is eternal power still parts the troubled waters of our lives. He still opens the way where there is no way. Maybe you're struggling in your own life with something that is really bothering you, really troubling you. Maybe you sense that you're too weak to go on, but this God of all power, this God that created the heavens and the earth, this God that brought forth the sun, moon, and stars, this God that opened up the Red Sea, he is your God. He is the all-powerful creator. Or think of it here. God rains manna for 40 years down in the wilderness to feed Israel. He provides their need. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, My God shall supply all your need. This all-powerful God is still the one that opens the troubled seas of our lives. This all-powerful God, the creator God, is still the one that meets our every need. You can trust him. We did not evolve. We are not merely skin covering bone. We're not simply a genetic accident. Come with me to the ancient sanctuary. Israel was guided by a pillar of fire by night, and they were protected by a cloud during the day. The all-powerful creator took care of his people in the wilderness and guided them. This all-powerful creator will guide you in the decisions that you must make in life. The creator has not forgotten his creation. God calls all the stars by name, and he hasn't forgotten your name. You know, there was a young boy traveling on a plane, and he was reading his Sunday school lesson, and a, and a professor of religion sat next to him, and he thought, I'm going to have a little fun with that boy. And he said, boy, I've noticed you're reading the Sunday school lesson. You must be a Christian. The boy said, yes. He said, can you tell me, son, something that God can do. Tell me one thing God can do, and I'll give you a shiny apple. The boy said, Mister, after the kid thought a little while, Mister, if you tell me something God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of shiny apples. You know, friend, that's the God we serve. Not weak, but powerful. He is the God of creation. This Christ entered into human flesh, faced Satan head on, and overcame him. And the all-powerful God of creation faced Satan in human flesh, trusting the Father, overcame temptation, and his power is available for you and for me. God's infinite power can defeat the forces of hell that try to destroy us. Maybe darkness has overcome you. Maybe you felt discouraged and depressed. Maybe you have fallen over temptation. I point you to the all-powerful creator. I point you to the one who in his life defeated the forces of hell and the one indeed who can chase back the evil shades of darkness in your own life. I point you to this living Christ. He is the all-powerful creator. He is the savior, the divine son, of God. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. We can become new. The all-powerful creator can recreate in us love where there was hate, kindness where there was greed, unselfishness where there was selfishness, purity where there was impurity. See, God is still in the creation business. And as I open the word of God, 
that same word, the written word in the Bible, carries the power of the spoken word. And as we listen to the word of God together, as you allow the word of God to bore its way into your heart and mind, he will recreate you in his image. If any man is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Christ wants to make a new you. Would you like to pray this prayer right now as we proceed in our presentation? Let's pause for a moment. Dear Lord, you are the creator of this world and everything in it. You're the God of awesome power. By faith, I believe that you can make of my life a new creation. I surrender to you anything not in harmony with your will and ask you to recreate your image in me. Would you like to say, Jesus, I believe you can make of my life a new creation. Wherever you are, would you like to repeat that with me right now? Dear Lord, I believe that you can make of my life a new creation. The all-powerful creator is still in the business of recreation. He's still in the business of inviting people to come to him and change their lives. Creation speaks also of a God of intricate design and careful planning. When you look at creation, everything about creation indicates design. It does not indicate randomness. It does not indicate chance. It does not indicate haphazardness. When you think of it, the planets orbit in an orderly fashion around the sun. These planets are not haphazard, stuck up there someplace in the heavens so that they are out of orbit colliding with one another. But an almighty God holds them in his hand and directs them in their orbit around the sun. Or you think about it. Every seed produces after its kind. When you plant a seed in the ground, the harvest is predictable. Apple trees produce apples. Orange trees produce oranges. Corn kernels produce corn stalks and ears of corn. Strawberry plants produce strawberries. There's a very orderly process in the universe. We don't see randomness. We don't see chance. We don't see haphazardness. Think of the intricate design of God. You know, God must have this fantastic imagination. Think of all the different colors of the fish. Think of how God places in some fish almost like a sonar radar. And these fish can go to the place where they were born after they have migrated hundreds, thousands of miles from there, after they've swum through the ocean, they go back. It's quite amazing when you think of the design of all creation. When you look at sea life with its multicolors of orange and yellow and blues and greens, and, and you look at the way God created the birds and all the infinite variety of the birds, but you look at precision, you look at design, you look at beauty, you look at order, and where there is design, there must be a designer. And where there is order, there must be a creator because order doesn't come out of chaos. You look at God and you see intelligent design. And where there is intelligent design, there must be an intelligent designer. Creation speaks of a God of intricate design, a God of careful planning, a God who is the originator of life. And because of that, creation matters. Not only does he have a plan for creation, not only does he have an intricate design in all creation, God's got a plan for your life. Your life is not to be some haphazard, lackluster life with no purpose or meaning. God has a design for your life. God has created you in his image. Psalm 48 verse 14 says, for this is our God, our God forever. And he will be our guide even to death if God created the birds and guides them through the air. If God created the fish, God created you. He fashioned you. He shaped you. And it, the scripture says he will be your guide. David cries out in ecstasy. Psalm 139, 14 and verse 14 and 15. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that they met my soul knows well. Think about it. David says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Think of the cell and think of the mitochondria, the little 
life center of the cell. You think of the nucleus of the cell with its amazing, amazing center of all life. And you begin to think about how complex we are. You think about the eye and its ability to see, the ear and its ability to hear, the heart as it pumps its blood, the stomach as I digest food, the lungs and the resp respiratory system. Or you think of how God was so caring. What if you didn't have fingernails? What if there were no fingernails? I mean, you're, you're whapping something, your fingers are always bloody and bruised. What if there are no eyelashes here and you're constantly getting dust in your eyes? Or think about that little trachea in your throat that brushes out the impurities. What if that didn't exist? God has taken care of every little tiny detail in creation. He is the God who hasn't missed one little item. That's why David says, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. David says, I, my frame was not hidden from you. In other words, God knows your name. God knows the circumstances of your life. And God has an immense purpose for your life. Now, creation also is the basis of all worship. If the devil can palm off the falsehood or lie or deception of evolution, there is no basis for worship. Why do we worship God anyway? Revelation 4 verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor in power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So the worthiness of Christ to receive glory, honor, and power, the worthiness of Christ to be worshipped is based on the fact that he created us. Now notice the last part of the text. It says you created all things by your will. They exist and were created. So we've come into existence not by chance, not by randomness, not by haphazard luck, but by the will of God. Has that solemn thought hit you yet? You exist by the will of God. You exist because God willed you come into existence. Why were you born at this moment of Earth's history? Why weren't you born a thousand years ago? Why weren't you born five years from now? Further than that, why are you a human being? Why aren't you a cow? Why aren't you a mosquito that somebody can just simply swat? Why are you you? You are you because God willed it. When the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of your personality, God threw away the pattern. God shaped you. God formed you. There's nobody like you. And creation says that you're more than one, billion, more than one of seven billion people calling at one another for living space on planet Earth. But creation says that you're special in God's sight. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things by your will. They are created. We came into existence by the very will of God. That means life is purpose. That means life has meaning. Psalm 33, verse 15, he fashions their hearts individually. Every baby born has been created by God. Although we live in a world of sickness and suffering where there are deformities that take place because we live in a broken world, that child is still God's child. That child is still one that God has purpose and meaning for in their life. And no matter how much that little one may suffer in this life because of the brokenness of sin and the heartache of our world, God still has an ultimate plan, and one day they will be whole again. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to nations. So it is not simply that life takes place after one is born, but rather when one is conceived, there is life there. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
God knew Jeremiah even in the womb. So what does this message of Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7 say? It says that we're created by God, that human life is sacred. That is why the taking of the life of the unborn. That is why the taking of the life of those who do not who are not able to speak up for themselves is a violation of the commandments of God. That is why the taking of the elderly life when they can no longer make a contribution to society, that is why that is not in harmony in any way with God's will. Why? Because creation says every life matters. The life of the unborn, the life of the those who have physical deformities. Their life matters. The life of those who are mentally retarded, that, that life matters. The life of those who are elderly and dying but can't contribute to society, that life matters. Every life in this broken, shattered world matters to God and God speaks words of hope and encouragement to every human being. He has a purpose for our life. The call to worship the creator is a call to understand and appreciate the value of every single human being. Every child has value in his sight. Every teenager has value in his sight. Every adult has value in his sight. Every senior citizen has value in his sight. Rich and poor, ignorant and wise, all have value in the sight of God. Evolution is dehumanizing because it says we're simply an enlarged protein molecule of the animal creation. Creation matters. Creation speaks of a God longing for personal fellowship and intimate relationship. Where there is design, there must be a designer. Where there is intelligent design, there must be an intelligent designer. And where there is love in the universe, there must be one who is the origin, the heart of all love. And the fact that we have the capacity to love, the fact that we have the ability to love, indicates the reality of an intelligent designer who we call the creator God, who the Bible calls the creator, who has placed that love within our hearts. So the call of creation is a call to respond to his love and enter into intimate relationship with him. The Christ that created us, the Christ that died for us, longs to have a relationship with us. The Sabbath, set aside at the beginning of time, is that appeal by God for his desire for relationship. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. Now notice God did three things on the seventh day. He rested. Why? Did he rest because he was tired? No, he rested knowing that we would be tired. And he rested in fulfillment, in completion of his creation. He sanctified that day. He set it apart as a special day for us to have fellowship with him. He blessed that day. He put a special blessing in the seventh day Sabbath, a blessing that's not in any other day, a blessing of intimate fellowship with him as the creator and he established the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. Now, don't misunderstand me. We can get a blessing from God any day we worship on. But if we want the Sabbath blessing, the special blessing that the Creator has placed in a day, the Bible doesn't say put the blessing in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth day. He placed that blessing in the seventh day. Why is creation important? Because it calls us to fellowship. God set aside the seventh day Sabbath as a palace in time, as a day for us to step out of the normal routine of life, the hectic pace of life, the pressures of life, and to have fellowship with him. Now, it is true, as I've mentioned, that every day we're to have fellowship with God, but life presses in on us. There are normal and natural responsibilities. But on Sabbath, 
every week. We are called from the mundane. We're called from the common things of life. We're called to have intimate fellowship with our Creator. Jesus wants to have fellowship with you. You know, in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 21, the Bible puts it this way. Jesus says, This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. This people I have formed for myself. And you know, in Isaiah 43 and verse 4, it talks about how precious we are to God. It says, Since you were precious in my sight, and you have been honored, and I have loved you. See, in Christ, we are precious. Precious. Some time ago, I read the story of a diver who is diving in the Pacific off one of the very remote islands. And he came across something that he thought was simply an old shell. It was large. He struggled to get it up. And he worked again and again in the sand, in the mud, the muck to get it up and finally get this old shell up, large, about this large, and didn't know what to do with it. And he brought it home. He dried it out. It was stinking. And finally, he put it in some back room in his house. A little later, he began to have a sense, maybe this shell is something special. As they called in specialists in deep sea diving and particularly pearls, they discovered up until that time in that house, the largest single pearl in the world worth multiplied millions. He had no idea how precious that discovery was. Have you sensed how precious you are to God? If God loses you, there is no way he can replace you. And that's what the Sabbath is all about. It's about the God that created you. It's about the God that formed you. It's about the God that shaped you. It's about relationship, entering into a relationship with this God. The Sabbath has an open-armed Christ, the Creator, this all-powerful Christ, this completely wise Christ, this all-intelligent Christ, this Christ who cares for the intimate details of creation and cares for our life. You know, Matthew says, every one of the hairs of your head are numbered. In other words, he knows every intimate detail. Matthew says in Matthew's gospel, he doesn't overlook the sparrow that falls. God is concerned. The Sabbath is a perpetual reminder of the God that cares for us. The Sabbath reminds us of the one who has provided all the good things of life for us. You know, in Psalm 84, verse 11, it says, no good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly. In a world of brokenness, in a world of chaos and confusion, in a world of fear, in a world of sickness, suffering, and death, in a world of hurricanes, tornadoes, tidal waves, and natural disasters. The Sabbath invites us to intimate fellowship with our Creator, to trust in His love, to rest in His care. The Sabbath is that oasis in the desert of this world. Sabbath is the eternal symbol of rest in Him. The world may be in chaos, but we can rest in Christ. The world may be facing natural disasters, but we can rest in our, the arms of our loving Creator. The world may be plagued with sickness and pestilences and violence, but we can rest in the arms of the one that cares for us. In a book called Selected Messages, on page 372, the author describes the preciousness of the promises of God the exceeding great and precious promises given us in the Holy Scriptures have been lost sight of to a great extent. Evolution has undermined Scripture. Atheistic communism has undermined Scripture, just as the enemy of all righteousness designed that they should be. He has cast his own dark shadow between us and God. See, that's the Sabbath is calling us back to relationship with God. So this dark shadow can be removed. 
that we may not see the true character of God. So Sabbath is a representation that we're resting in Christ, resting in his love, resting in his care, resting in his goodness. The Lord has proclaimed himself to be merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance in goodness and truth. Then the writer says, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I've answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. What does that mean? It means this that as we rest in the loving arms of our Creator, we are resting from our works, trusting Him for salvation. So Sabbath is a symbol, not of righteousness by works, not of legalism, but it's a symbol of rest, resting from our labors and trusting in His works, resting from any goodness that we may have, trusting in His goodness resting from all anxiety about salvation and trusting in his peace that floods our hearts and floods our souls. The Bible says in Genesis 2-3, in it, the Sabbath, he rested from all his work which God created and made. Just as God rested on the Sabbath from his work, we rest from all vain attempts to achieve our salvation. We rest in his love, rest in his care. That's what Sabbath is all about. And that's why the devil hates the Sabbath. That's one of the reasons he's introduced evolution to this world, to undermine the creator God so we would not sense our rest that comes only in him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. What is this rest? For he who has entered his rest, that's Christ's rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. On the seventh day of the week, God ceased from his works and rested. We rest every seventh day, not because we believe keeping the commandments of God saves us, but we rest in his love. We rest in the assurance of salvation he gives us. We rest in the security of the cross. We rest in the confidence of the Christ who descended from heaven to earth to live in human flesh, to meet Satan head on and to die in our behalf. The Sabbath is a symbol of rest, not works. It is a symbol of our trust relationship with Jesus. Now there is this sense of the Sabbath as an eternal link. Now you may ask the question, how is the Sabbath an eternal link and what is the Sabbath an eternal link of? When you look at our world today, it's a broken world. It's a shattered world. It's a world filled with sickness, suffering, and disease. The Sabbath is a link in a golden chain it leads us back to creation. And there at creation, we sense that God created us. He fashioned us. We sense that he's the God of integrate design, that he's the God of vast intelligence and the God of all power. The Sabbath leads us back to a perfect world in Eden. The Sabbath also leads us to rest in Christ for our salvation but the Sabbath points us forward. It points us forward to beyond what is to what will be. It points us forward to eternity rather than our being locked in the time of this world. When we come to Sabbath, we look forward to that eternal Sabbath where one day we will rest with Christ in eternity. And one day every week, we will come to worship him with the men and women who are redeemed from all the ages. Can you imagine this? They come from the north and south. They come from the east and the west. As Isaiah says in Isaiah, the 65th chapter, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. We come from the east and the west. We come from the north and south. We come to sing praises to the one that created us. We come to sing praises to the one that redeemed us. We come to worship him forever and ever on Sabbath through the ceaseless ages of eternity. 
Why does creation matter? Because it points us to an all-powerful, all-intelligent God. Why does creation matter? Because it points us to a God that has purpose for our lives. Why does creation matter? Because it points us to a God that has this world in his hands. It points us to the God that created us, the Christ that redeemed us, and the Jesus that is coming again for us. This divine creator can recreate your heart. He can recreate your life. Would you like to say, Lord, you're the mighty creator. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. While on others you are calling, do not pass me by. Would you like to say, Jesus, I accept you as my creator. I accept you as the one that re can, can recreate my heart and make me new again. Would you like to say, Lord, don't pass me by. And he has never passed by one that's come to him. Jesus said, come unto me. Jesus said, he that comes to me, I'll never cast out. Listen, as Charles sings, and make your eternal decision for him right now. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, Hear my humble cry While on others thou art calling Do not pass me by Let me at that throne of mercy Find a sweet relief there in deep contrition, hail my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by Trusting on thee in thy merit Would I seek thy face Heal my wounded, broken spirit Save me by thy grace Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in the heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, do not pass me by, do not pass me by. And the good news is, he will not 
pass you by. He created you, not simply to live 50, 60, 70, 80 years, wherever that is. He created you not simply to live in this life and to die and to go into the grave and have worms eat your body and be gone forever. God created you with a purpose to know him, to follow him, to love him, to serve him, to live with him for all eternity. You have a destiny with Christ. Your destiny is eternity. And that's what creation is all about. He created you because he wants you with him forever. He redeemed you on the cross of Calvary because he wants you with him forever. He's coming back to take you home because he wants you with him forever. There's nothing more important to Jesus than your being with him forever. That's what these three cosmic messages are all about. It's about a God that loves you so much that he wants you with him in eternity. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for a God that longs to be with us, a God that considers us precious in his sight, a God that's created us unique, that we have a special place in your heart that only we can fill. And so, Lord, we long on this earth to have that friendship with you. We hear the call of Christ through these messages of the three angels to worship the Creator. And Lord, we desire with all of our hearts to worship you now and forever. In Christ's name, amen.